The following interview was conducted with William D. Gregg, Secretary and Assistant Treasurer of the Purdue Research Foundation, Emeritus, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, June 17, 2009, as residents in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good afternoon, Mr. Gregg. Thank afternoon. you very much. Okay, tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. All right. <clears throat> I was born in uh, southern Illinois, Lawrence County, across the river from Vincennes, about 28 miles. My dad was a farmer and worked on construction, and mother was worked in the bank and eventually became trust officer. And Do you have any siblings? And I, I have a si I have a sister. Like. Sister, I went. We lived in the country, of course, and <clears throat> grade school was one room about a quarter of a mile from home, which we walked to. And so the first eight grades were in this one-room school. There were three people in the class, two girls and myself. The that, total? That in our, in my, in my class, that was it. And uh, Did you stay all day or would you go home for lunch? No, stay all day. we pack our lunch. You know, fried egg sandwich is still one of my favorites. <laughs> Not peanut butter and jelly, huh? Not peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> the classic. <laughs> On that, so. Yeah. And I remember we had the superintendent of schools who would come and give us our awards when you could write very good and your certificates would have the big peacocks with a tail out on them, you know, when you had perfect spelling or, or things like that, you know. So yeah, it was always kind of interesting. Yeah. And, it's nice to look back on old events like some that. Some of those things, you know. Yeah. On that. And then we went to... Uh, High school at Bridgeport, which it was in. We lived in a non-high district, so we could pick any one of three high schools. And so my sister then, who was 18 months older than I was, she was going to Sumner, Illinois, which was our original home address. And I was going to go to Bridgeport, so she had already been two years, so she transferred and went to Bridgeport with me. So we both graduated from. From there. Okay. Well, tell us a little about high school. Were any activities or yeah. athletics? Or what was it like? Played basketball on it, run track on it. Uh, Did you have any meets at all? That Not like it is today, though, with all the intramurals. Well, there's intramurals, but there's a lot more competition today in, the in high school and college as well. Yeah, yeah. But we'd have, you know, in the track meets, we were in the North Egypt Conference on it, and we had. Uh, Salem, Flora, Centralia, uh, Largeville, and uh, well, boys and girls in track as well. Girls and girls had some track, okay, but not very, not very much. Mm -hmm. On it, I just don't remember girls running, sure, running track. On it, track seemed to be big. Football, of course, was big. My mother wouldn't let me play football, so I didn't do that. <laughs> but I ran the mile and pole vaulted, and uh, Very good. found it interesting, you know. Sure. And but you had to go home and then start doing your chores. So. Right. Yeah. So we farmed like that. And then what so what uh, what did you have on animals as well as we had the, uh, hogs and sheep and cattle uh -huh. and grain farm. Okay. On that. Do you still have, is it still is the farm still in the family? No, we're the, uh, in two thousand. Three. After mother died, we sold the farm. My sister didn't want to keep it, and uh, so we sold the farm. Sure. Okay. On that. And then comes college, and you went to Eastern Illinois, is it? Well, right. I went to uh, Sanford Brown Business College in St. Louis. Uh, see, I graduated in high school in '48, so then I went to Sanford Brown Business College and was out there two years, 40, about three years, two years of college, and then uh, played basketball there on the team, and uh, went through the business college and waited approximately a year, and then I was drafted and uh, was Just inducted during the Korean in, War? During 51, yeah. 53, during the Korean conflict, and was in the 101st Airborne. On that, and after I got out, then I did. You sit, were you over there in Korea too? I did not have to go. Oh. I ended up being frozen my post. I never did figure out why or how. Where were you, where were you located? Camp Breckenridge, Kentucky, and uh, you know we were inducted in St. Louis, 
they sent us to Fort Custer, Michigan, and they told us we'd either go to Hawaii up to base over there or Leonard Wood or some, another place in Philadelphia, seems like, someplace. And there was like eight of us got assigned to Camp Breckenridge, Kentucky. And we kind of figured out, well, how do we get that? <laughs> and all of us, that was the closest base they could have sent us to to our homes. Oh, just across the river, you know, <clears throat> from Morgan Field, Kentucky. Oh, so I was there and, and uh, played company basketball there. And the major told me that, called me up one time. I was pulling first sergeant of a company, which I shouldn't even been doing, because all of our cadre were back from Korea. All had silver stars or shot up and assigned to jobs that they couldn't do. And so that's how I ended up being pulling the first sergeant of a company as a corporal. And uh, he called me up and said, you aren't out for post baseball or regiment baseball. And I said, well, I said, uh, I'm doing the first sergeant, you know, I'm busy. And he said, what do you do between the hours of two and five in the morning? Well, I said, I need to sleep. And he says, Griggs, you will report for baseball this afternoon. So I reported for baseball. <laughs> no major tarpley. We had to certify that we had no paper in our area. And an EM can't certify in the service. But he made you certify. So it was kind of interesting. <laughs> but that's how I ended up just being kind of froze. I, I uh, spent two weeks in Fort Knox on discharge mm -hmm. and ended up being a regimental supply sergeant for the, for the regiment. And so I got out in November, and then I went to Eastern Illinois State Teachers College at that time. Okay. And, uh, now, you'd already had a couple of years, but did you start at the beginning? Or? I started at the beginning. None, okay. of, none of your credits from Business College were transfer, even though some were the same books. On it. So the credits didn't transfer. So I went straight through, summers and all. Did my practice teaching in Lawrenceville. And, uh, were you married at that time? Or uh, when you were in college? Not. I was married just as I, uh, about halfway through. What was college like when was he, was, well, it was, you, you lived on campus? No, oh. I happened to live with my aunt who was a school teacher there Okay. in Charleston. And so. No, oh, that worked out. And well. that worked out very nicely. Yeah. What about the air athletics, any track? Did you continue with some athletics? I did there? not do any athletics okay. there on it. And, uh, was this, what was the size of your of the uh, school at that time? I don't really know for sure. I'd say maybe eight or nine hundred. Okay. Okay. Or Were many like of them that. from around that area? Yeah, a lot okay. of them. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's one of those places where you uh, there was one, maybe one residence hall. There wasn't many residence halls, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of them didn't stay over. They were called suitcases because they all just went home on weekends. Sure. On it. Yeah, okay. uh, Illinois had a good junior college system, which Indiana did not have, right. and didn't have for a long time. That's right. In fact, I think they, the big universities fought that yeah, for a long time. For a case. long time. Yeah. On it. Then what came next after you got your degree? Well, I did my practice teaching, and then I came to a job offer at Purdue. Tell us about how that came about. And, what that uh, was. It's one that it just came through because. Uh, the, the placement service at the, at Eastern had evidently had something there that they had gotten, and they were looking for someone in accounting. My major was accounting and minor in econ and minor in history, and uh, so I came up. I finished my practice teaching in the in the uh, last quarter of '56 on it, and. Uh, but I graduated as a class of 57. And so I came up and interviewed with uh, Irvine Wilson, who was uh, family housing and student organizations. Tom Morrissey was student organizations. Wynn Henschel was Purdue Research Foundation and R.B. Stewart. And so I went through with those people and it was hard. And came to work the first working day of 1957. Okay. 
And, well, and um, what was the campus? That, where was it? How? Where did you live? And tell us a little about your early days. Now, did you start working for PRF? Then was this an opening in PRF at that time? There was a half time, half time with student housing and student organizations, half time with PRF. Okay. So my first six months was with student organizations, and the second half was with. Purdue Research Foundation. Okay. Where were the heck, where were you housed? In Hub, was that known as Hubdy Hall? Was that where? Hubdy, we were in Hubdy. Uh, at where Right Hall. where the trustee's office is now. Okay. And that's where RB had uh, the office where your current executive vice president treasurer is. Okay. And we had the office right next door, which is now trustees. And then the elevator was over here. And so when Henschel was in there, and the, he had a little office. And the secretary and myself were in the area out there. And, uh, what were your initial responsibilities or duties? Just doing accounting work okay. on that. Mm -hmm. You know, closing the books and recording the transactions. Sure, that by paper. Of, by paper. Okay. Everything, was, everything was by paper yeah. on that. And after the first six, first six months was PRF, then they wanted me to stay with PRF and not go back. Do. What did you do for student organizations and housing? What organizations? Yeah, they worked primar primarily with uh, student organizations and with their cash flow. Oh, okay. And so you, you'd reconcile their bank balances and who, who had what kind of money and that sort of thing yeah. on it. Uh, set up how, you, how, to recon how to reconcile it. Yeah. The campus was the enrollment was what thirty? No, not that. I don't think 20. it was that much. No, I was trying to think fifteen or twenty, maybe something. I would say fifteen thousand, maybe something yeah. like that. Okay. On it. All right. Where did then? Where did you live when you came on campus? Uh, I lived out on uh, McCormick Road. Uh, you know where um, Maple's Trailer Service is on Fifty Two. It's about the oldest thing I can think of, and there's green, used to be Green Gables. Yeah. Well, okay. McCormick Road right there and go up, and I lived in a, in a house that belonged to the Hinkleys. Oh, okay. And it's about, you know, a quarter mile up. Sure. I think. Yeah. Next to a farm. Yeah. And so we were there, and so we rented. So you, got, you were married by that time, huh? Yes. Oh, where did yeah. you meet your wife here at Purdue? No, I, oh. met, I met her at, uh, at Vincennes. And a New Year's Eve party. Very good. Okay. On that, so you had a house out there then. Where you lived out there. I rented. Oh, rental. Okay. I rented out there. Okay. On that, and I rented there until sixty-one. Sixty-one, I bought a house in uh, Barbary Heights. Okay. On that one that where we had developed it, and I knew everything in it. That was one of the areas. I read that. Any areas? That was the old. Robert Bowe's property that was given. He, we got that. We PRF got that, and the other side was Martin Bowe's property, where the car wash and Payless area in there coming up is in mm -hmm. Westminster. It was all Martin Bowe's property. That's so quite they, a bit. So they were brothers. Oh, okay. Yeah. In there. Uh, there used to be a farm, farmhouse right there on the east side of the road. Oh, okay. On yeah. it. On oh, let's go and tell us about how your changes and go talk, talk about PRF and some of the activities that you were involved in and one thing. Who well, is it? They have directors. And we have a board of had a board of directors. There was of um, of. Uh, the, pre the I want to say twelve. The president of the university is always the president. Has always been is the, been the president of okay. of PRF, and the trustees were one category, and national counselors was one category, and alumni research counselors was one category. Um, were your excuse me? Were your offices in Hovde? Yes, we were. We were there on the second floor. And then eventually we moved up to the third floor because they wanted to redo the second floor. And so we went to the, we went upstairs on the top floor, which used to have little, little offices in it. And then they remodeled that all up there. Yeah, it's uh, all different now. Uh, 
new service was up there with Tommy Johnson and Jack Hanna were up there. Mm -hmm. uh, research contracts were at the far end, north end there with research contracts. And the Division of Sponsor Programs was in kind of the middle area. And then we were in the south end. Okay. Juana, so all, right. all of us were kind of kept together okay. Juana, since we dealt in this in the same area to a great degree. Right, okay. Did you, you kept on with the uh, uh, controller and secretary and, tre and treasurer, was that what you, or your do titles that you had? Well, I was accountant, staff accountant, mm -hmm. and then become assistant treasurer. And uh, after Jim Lowe retired, by then I became corporate secretary also. What did that involve as corporate secretary? I'm thinking of researchers that might, when they hear that, what would be the corporate secretary? Yeah, in the minutes of the meetings okay. and record those and, okay. and uh, have those ready so when the auditors come, you had that, you had something to look back into and they'll all be filed in the minute book. It would sure. be transcribed by, the, by a secretary and then put in the minute books. Yeah. What's the liaison with, say, with the trustees and PRF or with the uh, university? Well, the trustees... The Board of Trustees is one category of members okay. of PRF. All the members of the Board of Trustees Board of are trustees. part of PRF? Right. Okay. That's one category. All right. And they elect three members to the Board. Okay. And so the University always knows what PRF is doing, right. so you're not working at cross-purposes. And at the same time, we know right. what the university is doing too, because there was a time when we run into problems with our vice president doing things that had already been turned down by the executive vice president of the university, okay. which run into problems yeah. and had to be solved right. on that. Yeah. Of course, you get input from the president too, do you not? Does it yes. Okay. Yeah. But, president, but still, the president runs the operation, but you're primarily your executive vice president and treasurer of the university is the one that you go to. Okay. On it. Okay. And so that's really the. That's really the linkage. That's the linkage right. okay. that we had. Like the person that comes to mind who I have interviewed and met uh, was Fred Ford. And yes, and Fred would have been the same right. sort of thing. It would have right. been R.B. and then Lytle okay. and then Fred. Right. Did R.B., um, did you interact much with him? I'm trying to think because people ask, and there, of course there was a book written about but did you interact any comments about uh, working with him or anything of that sort? He was quite, people address him a lot for a lot of things he's done and having read the book I understand yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. well he, he used to he loved to go through things you'd done maybe found an error he'd call you in and tell you he just didn't want to make the same error twice not that he was going to can you but he wouldn't be very happy on it. I used to slip a decimal on, on uh, Lincoln National Livestock I believe it was, and he'd always get that. <laughs> on that. But I used to get, I also used to get, which I think, I remember it always kind of strange, on Monday morning you'd get called in and he'd give you a church bulletin and down the sides would be these notes <laughs> that, that, he'd written that, while that he'd written while he was in church. In church. <laughs> the sermon wasn't very interesting that day, I guess, yeah. and what you were supposed to do because we were working on a water trust. and. So, something like that, and he'd have it written down, what do you want to do, we're going to sell these D&E bonds and to this trust. Do they, do you people, does the tr uh, foundation handle the endowment for the university? No, no we, we used to, everybody used to have their own okay. sort of thing, then they gathered and went together, and now it, it's all, it used to be uh, Wynn Henshaw, and then after Wynn, uh, after Wynn we had, uh, that's okay, you can that's insert bad. it in there. Yeah. I don't want to pop right out and then I'll do it. But anyway, our, our treasurer, Fred Ford, and your, uh, it would have been like Howard Lyons, that 
that would be the university assistant treasurer okay. of the board of the board of trustees and uh, Jeff Wilson, and they would meet with William Blair and besides, and then from the investment office sometimes it would be Jim Binken over there. Right. Uh, but and so they would make those decisions. And then it got to the point to where there were so many new financial vehicles out there and different ways to invest funds that they decided they would outsource. And uh, so Purdue Alum, Alumni Foundations, Endowments, PRF's Endowments, Purdue University's Endowments were all gathered together and was all handled through. Uh, the university now has them all. Right. But this group used to handle all of those together. And uh, then you had a certain percentage of that total portfolio. And so your revenue and whatever happens would be shared with that sort of thing. I understand. And then okay. that's how they begin to share with the, with the universities, uh, out to departments and so forth, out of their endowments. It's based on a rolling average, right. 12, 12 quarters, I believe, over 12 quarters. So you would average out what you were getting. We always used to say, well, they always understood when they were getting more money. They never understood when they got less money. But <laughs> that happens. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I noticed that, um, which people say, you people, uh, PRF owns, they own the real estate. They own a lot of real estate. We own quite a bit of real estate. We used to be known as the occupants of West Lafayette. And that's the way the neighborhood used to think of us, I guess, because every, University of Russell and Waldron, every time one of those properties come up, we'd end up buying it because there were a lot of homes along there. Yes, yeah, there was quite a lot of residents. And so we were trying to buy those up for the future expansion of the university. And then we would rent that mm -hmm. out to new faculty coming in so they'd get brainwashed to the price of property in West Lafayette and what school system they wanted to get into. Sure. And then after two years, why they ought to have been acclimated and know where they can go on it. So... Uh, and those were stayed on the, stayed on the tax rolls. We did not take it off. A lot of people thought we took those off the tax rolls, but actually they stayed on the tax rolls. Okay. And if we wanted to do anything to them, of course, if we were gonna, we'd have to remodel a lot of them. Oh yeah. And as a new person, why well, you'd have to be sure fire hazards, uh, where st well, they might have had students living way upstairs, uh, we couldn't do that because it was no longer grandfather yeah. on that. But uh, you take care of, you took care of the maintenance too. And we would take well the university would would do the maintenance we had to pay them for the maintenance. Sure. On it. So that, that kept them busy. And when they were too busy with some things then we had outsourced that out. Whatever we made on the property, the gross income minus uh, expenses, then and the net income was amortized against the cost of the property. So whenever the university was ready for their property, they got it at its amortized value. So it saved the taxpayers of Indiana a lot of money because sure. if you had to go out in today's market to buy it when you went at that time, why well, you'd have to pay a higher price sure. for the property. Uh, that began to change in later years because we were uh, a lot of properties were completely amortized on them when they wanted the parking garages, that sort of thing. Now, sure. if we leased the property to the university, we'd take it off the tax rolls, which we were entitled to do. Right. Okay. On One of the things that comes to mind, I remember when I came, is what we used to live on was Catherwood Gardens, you know, down at the foot of Happy Hollow Road. It's Catherwood Gardens? Catherwood Gardens. and right. uh, Parkside. When a, a friend of when I first came here, uh, I belonged to a garden club, and we stopped down there to pick up somebody, so... I'm familiar with that, just because it was that complex, and I'd come down there a lot. I but I knew there were others in the community, and you work with the BJ city. Castlewood is that yours? Can't, well, right, the foot of Happy Hollow. There used okay, to be some yeah. homes in those streets. Now they've changed it. It's, well, it's we had we had national homes we built there, and oh. they started in 1956. Okay. B. J. Catherwood, who uh, he was in the chemistry department, I believe. 
he lived on that road that goes straight through from yeah. Happy Hollow over to 43. Yeah. On that side was the Catherwood property, and over here was uh, Dick Kendig, who used to be the ticket manager. Yeah. And then we built 17, I believe, 17 houses. No, 22 houses in there. In that near, that would in be that, there, around there. They were national homes. Yeah. That was built in there, and that was done because we needed housing for staff people. Sure. On it, and so right. we we built those in there, and we'd sold off the upper part there, which was Knob Hill, and that's probably one of your first big apartments that came in. Yeah. Uh, that was sold off, and become become apartment project, which is still going. Sure. On that. But our houses, the Parkside houses, had run out and they were no longer being used that much in their age. Because I remember that's when we first booked all those. There was two different times that we built those, about a year apart. Okay. That was, I want to say, 56 and 57. Okay. Those were done. Right. You work pretty closely with the with West Lafayette, too, don't you? And, and Lafayette as well? Or uh, more West Lafayette, probably? West Lafayette. Right, okay. Uh, a lot with the, the sewers. Going to north, so as the city expanded north, right. uh, we put in uh, three different sets of sewers in there, in which we we financed the sewers, and then as uh, the city collected the money from the individuals who bought the lots and paid the tap fees, then they would pay that back to PRF yeah. over a period. We got a low interest rate on that, okay, on that sort of thing. Uh, do you work with the do you, uh, do you work with the state at all? Does PRF have any uh, connect, uh, do anything with the state of Indiana? Not necessarily. Okay, not really. Not really. You know, you dealt with the state. Oh, some, sure. Oh, yeah, but, right. But, I understand. You know, like the Lily Land down in Indianapolis with Eagle Creek, in that area there, they dealt with the state. When J. K. Lilly gave us that fifteen hundred acres down there. Sure. On that, that was we ended up being sold to the. Board of Flood Commissioners and Board of Park Commissioners, right, okay. uh, where they have that. But PRF had some of the property. The university had most of the property. But we had to work with getting that done Okay. on it. Uh, the only other place we'd work with the state was if they were going to come through and build a road or something, and we might work with the state there. And sure. we'd work closely with physical plant for how they were going to, right. to do that. Right. And uh, we would buy up farm real estate for the expansion for uh, the farm program, right. agriculture. We bought up quite a bit of land north it's where the current, the Baker, the Baker Calvert complex now. Mm -hmm. We picked up that land as we as we went along. Some through trust, some through annuities. Uh, and we did that so we could release the land north of the bypass, which we told the city we would do. And when that came on board, it was ready for the city, it was ready to move on north. The legislature, the state legislature, then appropriated $15 million, I believe it was, for the ag campus to be developed okay. on it. But in the meantime, we run the land and farmed it and, sure. and amortized the cost. Right. University, what's now known as University Farms, that was. Uh, property of the Purdue owned. Was that Purdue property too? Yes. Okay. That was Purdue. Because when I first came, that was all just land, you know. That's right. Farmland, excuse That's me. That's right. Yeah, that was university owned land. And uh, then we'd end up and we'd buy that land from the university at its appraised value on it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then we would take that land and develop it. Sure. You have to be a little careful in developing the land because it could become unrelated business income. And so you'd have problems with IRS. Right. right. And so you had to kind of watch how you did that sort of thing. Sure. And we helped the, the city with their, with uh, the expansion to the high school. The West Side High School? Mm -hmm. Okay. We bought up 215000 of those B bonds, which I don't think paid any interest, if I remember, on it. And we've helped out, the, you know, the Happy Hollow Park. Mm -hmm. 
We developed Happy Hollow Heights. We, uh, we helped with Sugar Hill development. All right. It's quite, quite involved in the, uh, in the life and the real estate yeah, of the community. Yeah, yeah, that was trying to help two staff members, you know. Sure. Get when, going. Uh, and there weren't as many apartments either years ago, no, too. No, that's but right. Varsity was one of the earlier ones. That's I really talked early. to people when they first came here years ago. That, that really that was, was about was, the only thing. Sure. Right, and that yeah. was built, it was primarily for faculty, maybe staff probably as well. So I just, you know, I know, talked about sometime trying to acquire that property, but we never could quite, quite get pull it, it yeah. off. The expense, expense was too much, I think, yeah. for, that, <laughs> for that sort of thing, especially when we redid the uh, Grand Street parking garage. You know, we tore that down, it was like a 700 car garage, and then we had to tear it down and made it a 1400 car garage. Yeah. And it's still hard to find a parking place there sometimes. <laughs> Tell me about it, right? <laughs> but we'd do, you know, we'd buy up land, uh, land that we had that we would use for the parking garages were all done through, we did it through Ross Aid Foundation. Which is a separate one. The separate right. foundation that was started. Actually, it was started before PRF. And they would then borrow the, the money to buy the land from PRF that we had, they would borrow the money tax exempt in the early days from the banks, and then you would lease that, build a parking garage with the money borrowed and lease that land and the facility to the university for whatever the, what you and I would call the mortgage rate, whatever it was, it's a tax exempt rate, and they would make those semi-annual payments, the university would make it to Ross Aid, Ross Aid would make the payment, and then whenever that's paid off, then it's deeded to the university. Okay. Uh, the same thing happened with uh, where the stadium's at, the old tilt farm. That's Ross Aid. There's like 90 acres there. And then that got paid off. And they bought the land and then they say, did the stadium and then we made all the additions. And each of that land, there's a, there's a master stadium lease that Ross Aid has. You know, these changes to pay for the whatever they're going to be they're doing. Going to be doing, and sure. then when that's paid off, it reverts back to a dollar again. Sure. Uh, it's a pretty good arrangement. And so it works out very nicely. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the new arrangement with IRS was uh, you eventually have to deed the property. You actually have to deed the property over. Whereas with the stadium, we didn't do that. Sure. Uh, but then a lot of it you didn't ask for. Uh, Tax exempt financing. The research park worked the same, same sort it was of way. All, that was Purdue property as well. It was the research park. It was always been Purdue property. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, no, I'll take that oh. back. The land north of of um, Cumberland. Maybe not all of it. North of Cumberland was where they called Phase Two. Okay. Of the research park. Okay. That's uh, the electric farm was. PRF, so they have to be on farther. Go farther this way. The old, where Amberley Estates is, that was university. Okay. On it. And immediately north of Research Park was farmed by the university, but it was owned by PRF. Okay. It's okay. an electric farm, and they got money for fly ash research, as I remember, for that. All right. I was thinking of, for the researchers, uh, I just want to clarify, that it used to be known as McClure Park. McClure Park was... And I just make a comment so they know. Yeah, McClure was. Park itself mm -hmm. was PRF. Okay. And we got that from Frank J. McClure. And there he used was to a be local a, person? Yes. Okay. And uh, he ran the... There was a trailer court in there. Mm -hmm. In that general area? Yeah, right oh. right there towards the front part. Okay. Uh, and that trailer court's out 52. Uh, it's west, clear on out, candlelight? Yeah, something like that. That was candlelight. Okay, oh yeah, right. It was in there. Okay. In fact, the, I think the sheriff used to live in that place at one time, on the old days. And so then we developed and developed that. So the first, the first one we brought in was State Farm. 
they were here when I came. Yeah, State Farm went in first, and that was kind of developing to set a developmental type price on the land. And then we go. That's a good size piece of yeah. a building yeah. out there. Yeah, and so it's been a pretty good size building. And then uh, Globe Union came in and and uh, you had an IBM out there one time. IBM was right. in uh, the building there to the they were in the front where the where the bank LNB was there in one end and the other side was IBM. Then IBM later moved on north to a facility of their own. Okay. On it, and we built um, TV where TV eighteen is was right. inland container. And when that fell through, then TV 18 took that over. Uh, Wolbeich Magnetics was right back of what you call census now, which is unoccupied. Uh, the old TPRC center, which was right. Tolukian. Right, oh yeah. And Because I used to do lit searches for some of the okay, people well, that was, yeah. And uh, that was done with tax-exempt financing, which PRF bought was at 3.11%. And then leased it to the university, and the into Lukian soft money research money paid for that building eventually mm -hmm. on it. And then the university got title to it, had to. And then we built Flex One and Flex Two, and then CTS come in down on the corner. The far right, yeah. And and then we got a fellow from. Electric engineer, electrical engineering, I want to say, over on the corner of the pond. Um. Hmm. I, I'm drawing a blank on the name. I've got, I've got, uh, C, CTS is not CTS is uh, Kissinger was in there with his when we started on the incubation centers that went into Flex yeah. Flex Two on it. Flex One had incubation where they could come in and try to come up with something they think. And they've expanded on those inc incubators or doing something. Oh, well, yeah, see, now they went over into Phase Two right. where there's a lot more incubation going sure. on. That's right. And they begin to go out and hunt for venture capital with them and try to give them some guidance. I think our incubation centers in, in uh, Flex One and Flex Two, we were probably Probably five to ten years too early with that concept. Okay, uh, would be my guess. But now they uh, now they seem to be gone, and, sure. and they're looking at venture capital. It's a challenge. I don't think the university was real strong behind the, the incubation centers in the early years. Mm -hmm. I think under Dr. Baring, they began to sure when you take it more of a force. Right. Well, you came. Hubbity was the president. Yes. And then uh, Hanson and, of course, Hicks. And Hicks in between. And, and, and then Dr. Dr. Jeske. Right. Jeske came, yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. I can remember uh, who was our president just before of the... Elliot. Elliot. He used to come into the office and talk to me. Nobody ever introduced me to him. I didn't know who he was. And we'd talk a while, and you see what the market was, and then he'd say, okay, I'll see you later, and away you'll go. And he may come in two or three times a week. I finally asked, <laughs> when did you? I said, who is the gray-headed fellow that comes in and talks to me? <laughs> he says, that's President Emeritus, Elliot. I said, oh. <laughs> Just as nice a fellow as you, <laughs> you never run across, you know, and I, don't, I didn't mind, except he never introduced himself, and I didn't either. I <laughs> he mean, he come in, out, ask, right? he asked the questions, and he tried to answer them, and, sure. and go on. That's right, on yeah. yeah. When did you retire from the university? In June of 2001. Okay. What have you been, what are your retirement activities, what have you been doing since then? Anything special that you'd like to share with us? Well, I don't, maybe nothing really special. Travel quite a bit. And I went on. But you, your wife said you go away in the winters. Yeah, usually we go someplace for okay. for a month or so forth. You know, used to go to Tucson some. Uh, we've been going down the last couple of years down to uh, Edisto. Uh, 
Island, which is south of Charleston, South okay. Carolina. Okay. It's not real warm there, but it's not real cold. She likes it because it's quiet. There's one store. Uh, Are there many houses on, on it? No. Do you rent a house when you're down there? Yeah, I'm, I'm a member of uh, Wyndham where you have points. Okay. And so you can travel any place they've got at resorts. And so... So that takes advantage so of So that kind of just is what we do is I look around and say, well, where do you want to go? She's kind of latched on to Edisto as being the place she likes to <laughs> likes to go. You know, I go, I can go on up to Myrtle Beach for a week or so, and then she doesn't like Myrtle Beach. Uh -huh. She says it's too busy. <laughs> do you have any any? What about your family? Do you have any children? I have three children. Okay. Did any go? Did they go to Purdue or? My daughter went to Purdue mm -hmm. for two years, a two-year program through the Tech okay. area, and then she went to down to Georgia where her husband was going. And, to Auburn, where her husband was going to, to school, and she f finished up there, and finished got a four-year degree and taught some there, and now she teaches school. Where do they live? And uh, they now live in Brackettville, Texas, and uh, she had been divorced and remarried, but, uh, and that's 28 miles from Del Rio, which is the border, and it's 125 miles south of San Antonio. And uh, she taught school in Iceland, mm. England, California. And now she's in uh, Tucson. And now her husband's in the Air Force, was in the Air Force, retired, but doing the same job he did when he was in the Air Force. Oh, okay. On that. He's a historian. Mm. Okay. On that. He used to be a crew chief, flight line. And then whenever they adopted two children from Honduras, she said, you need to do something besides that. So he transferred to be a historian. And it's turned out to be a real good, good. historian. That's nice. On that. And I have an older, my next one's a son. The older son is here in Lafayette. He works for Wabash Trailer on that, maintenance supervisor. Is he still, and still, still there? Still there okay. on that. And then I have a younger son that's in West Palm Beach, Florida, looking for work. What sort of work had he done? He was... He had worked with Adams and Marshall in Indianapolis. It built a lot of duplexes. Oh, okay. So he's in construction. I mean, construction sort of thing. And then he, he left there and went to work for WCI Communities. And WCI built high-rise condo hotels on Singer Island in Florida. He was a project supervisor on two of those where you have 3,000 square foot condos and then you have hotel rooms which people buy and then when you're not in them, one, they are leased out for you as a hotel sort of thing, which is a, kind of a new concept. But they expanded too fast, I think, and he ended up filing bankruptcy, so he lost his job. And that time, the price of houses and everything in Florida, and the financial crisis is just out three small kids. And so That's hard. Dad's trying to support him somewhat, and yeah. I said, he's getting hard on my retirement. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, hard. it's hard, you know, it really is. On that. Um, any, did you, were you still a member of any professional associations when you were with PRF or any associations that you belonged to or in business at all or? No. Uh, okay. No, I didn't. didn't I'm going to ask you. I, joined, uh, I didn't join anything. You know, okay. But it worked with. Uh, I know you s support sports, but let me ask you, do you have a uh, favorite Purdue tradition that you'd like to share with us uh, and or an outstanding event in your life or both comes to mind? Sports is a tradition around here. In yeah, the I, enjoy, I enjoy the sports, but yeah. I just think my time at Purdue, when I came, I thought I'd only stay three or four years. You know, I ought to do some courses. But, you know, work was fun. It was fun when I retired, and I really... Did you have to, did you have to retire at, at 65? Or, or was no. It, so no. it was past that stage. Did you think, were you eligible for early retirement? Could you have taken that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they had the same... Same, same fringes, visit. same fringes as okay. Purdue had essentially. Okay. Uh, so you have the TI and Craft and TI and Craft, sure. Yeah, same sort of thing. Usually have, but as we got bigger, why and the way things are going, it's tighter and tighter. On you know, you have you're here and we're over here. You know, so right. some of the stuff they have to start on their own. Right. On it, but essentially, it's the same. Sure. Same thing. I think when I turned 66, I took 
uh, went to work at 60% time. Worked at all, so I worked three days a week mm -hmm. on that, and I stayed with that. And I said, I'd give my wife time to get used to me under her feet on it. Then we'd travel some. So <laughs> I did that until 2001. That's when I just became a special assistant to, to our, our executive vice president and treasurer. Are you still doing that? No, I don't know. I still go back once in a while. I did for several years when they wanted me for something, and they had some problems, or I hid stuff so well they couldn't find it on it. We need resources of people all yeah. the time. And so, yeah, I go back uh, somewhat on that. Less and less all the time. But I enjoy the people. It was fun to go to work. Uh, and you like what and you like what you're doing, and, and you I like, like your what colleagues, I was doing and it all because it comes together. It all fits fits real well, you know. And the work we did was fun. Sure, you had days you didn't like, but overall, you know, it would be a great job for anybody. As Jimmy Stewart would say, it's a wonderful life. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, and you know, we had to get to work with Ross Aid Foundation. We got to work with Purdue Academics. Corporation. We worked with Indiana Purdue at Fort Wayne because we had all those books. Now we have McClure Park Inc., which was a taxable corporation. And, and you had Leah sign with the regional campuses too. And the regional sure. campuses that we worked with because all of them in the early years we had, you know, we were in the Barker Center at Michigan City and we were in an athletic facility at Fort Wayne. Uh, they had a place in Indianapolis. I think it was a. Is that Meridian? Uh, that was the athletic club oh. in the early years in Indianapolis. Then and you were on Meridian or 38th or something like that. 38th right? Street was, the was in Purdue. When, uh, when we, we went out of the athletic club, the Indiana Athletic Club, I believe it was. Down Indianapolis there. Athletic Club? Yeah. 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 We were in that facility. And then we got to land there from. Uh, we were able to pick up on. Uh, Woodland and 38th Street. Because I know and some faculty built, that taught there. Yeah, we, we built the Cranert Building. Here on campus? No. Oh, the one down, down there. there? Right. And then the other was what we call the Standard Oil Building, where we got the, the money to build and we leased at the Standard Oil. And they operated that building. And uh, we got that paid off through their mortgage and when that was ready to go. Eventually, we sold that to Indiana University when the legislature said PRF would handle Fort Wayne, Indiana would handle Indianapolis because they had the med center and everything there. So we sold them that property we had there. But most of it was all paid for because we had the gift from Herman C. Craner and Eleanora for that facility there. And at Fort Wayne, we got out of the old the old uh, athletic facility downtown on Jefferson and Barr Street and uh, got, <coughs> got land deeded to us from the mental health department, moved to cemetery up there, and Indiana went in with us up there, and we originally started on a space utilization ratio, and then eventually it's all run by. <coughs> By, PR, by the university, which is really Indiana Purdue Foundation, and we built the facilities there, and if it was on our land, then it's leased to the university, and it's paid off the same way it was with the other I described, where the mortgage, and then it's deeded to the university. And each time you would just deed them the, the square footage around the building that the building sets on, because they're only buying so much on it. Uh, and now they're building residence halls there. Mm -hmm. And so they got a nice facility there, land given to them. And uh, at Michigan City, by then we started the Purdue Academic Facilities Foundation uh, right along the 431 and uh, the interstate. We picked up land there, Long Beach property. It was farm property. And uh, borrowed money we qualified. We couldn't do it through Ross Aid, which is Ross Aid handled all the extension centers originally. And and to build there, your sole purpose had to be to build academic facilities. Well, Ross Aid had physical welfare students and had a stadium, a few other things, so it was easier to qualify. 
as your sole purpose is to build athletic facilities, and so we built the athletic facilities there, borrowed two million three hundred thousand, and got our million dollars from the government, and built the facilities there, and that foundation has all been liquidated now because that land all got all paid off eventually. Some of it's still owned by Ross Aid Foundation, but the part the university had is all now university mm. on that. So that foundation went out of being on it. Uh, and the extension centers originally, when they were just those centers, which, they is, now, started, which is now a regional campus. Which are now extension. regional campuses. Okay. They all get four-year degrees sure. oh, yeah. on it. And they're autonomous. And they're all autonomous because in the old days, the money came to Purdue Central Campus and Purdue allocated money to them. And then the legislature would then give money directly to Purdue but for the campus. Right. And that's when the legislature began to want a more autonomous control. And eventually, then they become on their own and swung off. Sure. All that. What did you do with what when IUPUI? Uh, came into existence. The, uh, the, what were Purdue was? Did they just sold that building that the yes. uh, 38? And, okay. Where they've been having classes. As I said, a colleague used to go down and teach. Well, the there. university took that over. Oh, okay. Indiana University. Oh, okay. All right. Indiana University. When it got to the point, we sold them the land that we had bought around the area where the two buildings were. Sure. And then, if we would have paid off the debt that was still on, like the Standard Oil building, you'd have to pay a penalty for prepayment. So we just sold the, the land, the, what was there left under the thing, we just sold that to Indiana University. Okay. And then it only lasted two more years, I think, and then that was sure. all they moved to the new Then they could sell off all that land themselves, and we had nothing more to do with it. Right. In closing, any uh, reminiscences or things that you'd like to, any of balls in your court? You look back or you look ahead or both? Well, I think it's uh, the uh, PRF, actually all of all the foundations did a key role. PRF did a, was the only ones truly with any money. And, and a lot of it's all restricted money, which people don't seem to understand a lot. Uh, they think you have a bottomless pit, uh, which isn't really true. You know, we had the David Ross money and the XR where you give the grants and, and you get the summer grants. And, you, and then we had the XL fund, which came from Charlie Lynn, uh, who was the vice president for EI Lilly. And that goes for uh, travel grants, that sort of thing. Uh, international travel. International travel on it. Yeah. Uh, let them further some of their own areas. Some of them can go on sabbatical and some get sure. additional training and come back to the university and help them with their teaching on it. Uh, there was just a lot of general fund type grants out of the XR, out of the PRF general fund. Uh, but, you know, with the market being down and that sort of thing. Well, then that makes your cash flow. Of course, we had a lot of you know, patents and copyrights, so we had uh, a lot of that's processed through. Uh, but there's usually only one payer out of a thousand patents that you get that's going to be a true payer. We had the, when I came, we had the old cottage cheese under Babel and Mather on the ag side. And you had Impulse Generator by George. We just missed out on the TV tube. Had a big lawsuit. It's George, over that. Roscoe George. Yeah, we had a big lawsuit over that. Uh, but, uh, but we all PRF did was prosecute the university's patent policy. That money doesn't necessarily belong to PRF. It's gathered in there. It can be in a venture capital fund but a third of it goes back to the department that generated the patent, the research. A third of it goes to the university, and a, and a third of it goes into the patent fund. Uh, and, uh, and that worked pretty well. The venture capital fund worked out pretty well. 
and now of the incubation. You know, incubation centers, why, that's where some of the money comes in where now they take a position in some of these companies to give them additional money. Whereas you can come in and you've done your research and the patent's almost ready to be patented, but you got to do a little more, sure. finish it up. And so this kind of helps. Sure. Uh, well, they, Gives you a little bit of a window. Yes, that's right. And uh, so they've done some of that. Mm -hmm. right. And I think that's still a work in process to see how that's going to be sure. and how much of that they can really, really do. All right. So I think, you know, they, I think the concept was, was good, mm -hmm. but it's just going to be a period of time. I think you, it takes if you can do like IU and the Crest toothpaste or Gatorade, Gatorade, Wisconsin with the, the Warfen, you know, then made lots of money. Right. And so if you think somewhere, you'll hit it one of these days. We've got, That's right. We've got, we lots, of, we've got lots of good researchers. Right. And you want to keep them. That's right. Uh, you got to keep working at it. You got to keep yeah. working at it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, overall my time at Purdue was, was great. Good. I want to thank you very much, Mr. Priest. It's been very, very informative. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah.